So um, our next presentation is coming from Alex, and I told you that my French is so bad that I won't um, say your last name. And I'll let you do that inter intervention yourself. Um, but it's on HLP, Housing, Land and Property and Natural Resource Guidelines that you believe can be useful for us as CCCM practitioners. So I'm very happy to welcome you here and um, please go ahead. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, and thank you everybody for your interest in this session. Um, so my name is Alexandre Carrivaubourg. Um, and as many of you know, humanitarian interventions on the scale of settlements, camps, and collective centers often encounter multiple complex issues related to housing, land, property, and natural resource tenure. This affects inter interventions at each stage of the life cycle of a camp or settlement. And so today I would like to share with you a newly curated set of guidance tools that help uh, CCM practitioners better engage with HLP and natural resources during these different phases. So I'm going to share the link in the chat. Oh, I also wanted to confirm, can everybody see my presentation? We see it very well. All right, fantastic. And uh, Oh, I sent it only to you, Jennifer, somehow in the chat. Let me send that again, the link for everybody. So the, the toolbox that I've just shared um, is divided into different themes. And so today I will go uh, into each of the themes and I'll share what I think are the strengths of the existing resources and identify what I identify as remaining gaps in the guidance with some recommendations for how to address them. Most of the featured tools were collected by members of the HLP in Camp Management Interest Group, which is hosted by the HLP AOR. The tools come from a wide range of organizations, um, and they have been included in this toolbox because of their relevance to global questions. Um, there are some situations where tools are from specific countries, but they raise important issues that global guidance has not yet addressed. If there are ad additional tools that you think should be included here, but haven't yet been put on the site, please feel free to reach out to me so that they can be integrated. I would also love to hear from your own recommendations for how to address the gaps in the existing guidance. So uh, hopefully in the conversation afterwards, we can reflect on that together. So in the early phases, let's look at the first phase, establishing um, camps and settlements. How camps and settlements are established and designed in the early days will have profound impact on the later phases, as well as on relationships between displaced peoples and host communities. As you know, many tensions between displaced populations and host communities have to do with issues of housing, land, and property, and natural resources. And even though camps and settlements are often established in emergency situations where decisions need to be quickly made, there are some critical tools that can help guide their establishment, especially before they set, settle into more permanent footprints. And under this phase, one of the most important steps is conducting due diligence. This is enshrined in the global sphere standards, um, but as of my review, there didn't seem to be a comprehensive global guidance tool explaining what due diligence is on the scale of a camp or settlement. Um, there's a lot of great tools, um, especially the, the shelter due diligence standard, which I also understand is being reviewed right now. Um, but there are a, a lot of great tools that look at sort of specific parcels and plots, but not something that necessarily on the scale of Cox's Bazaar or the, uh, the, the presence of um, informal tented settlements over a, a large uh, landscape. Um, and so how to conduct, uh, and so how to do due diligence for sort of a large scale site is very different than doing uh, due diligence on a parcel by parcel basis. Um, and I think that developing this could be one of the top priorities for the camp management sector. In the meantime, there are some great tools that have been recently produced for informal tentative settlements in Northwest Syria and for Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh that will be shared in this toolbox. The ones from Bangladesh haven't been uploaded yet, but uh, I'm just waiting for permission uh, to, to put those tools up on there. The, the second theme is negotiating for land rights for short and medium term. So tensions over land are often barriers for humanitarians to deliver services, especially in informal tented settlements. Landowners often re refuse to enter into clear and fair agreements with IDPs or refugees who are occupying the land and often threaten them with evictions. This is often rooted in the landowner's own fears of being dis dispossessed of their land. 
and or due to the fact that the settlement was established on land that they had previously used for their livelihoods. There are other factors, but some, these are some of the two recurring ones. Um, under that same logic, landowners often refuse to allow humanitarian actors to connect these sites to water utilities or to build permanent infrastructure like houses or latrines, which as again, you all know, are essential for people to be able to live in dignity. So ultimately this is an access issue. And I think it would be really interesting and useful for humanitarians to have specific guidance on how to enter into negotiations with landowners, um, which would encourage, which would acknowledge their legitimate concerns and find ways to encourage them to allow IDPs and refugees to stay um, and to allow uh, humanitarians to build that infra essential infrastructure. And then last theme under this phase is land use and site planning. This is a critical role for CCCM practitioners. It shows up multiple times in the global camp management toolkit um, and invariably touches on issues of housing, land, property, and natural resource rights. Um, to this date, I have not encountered any guidance documents for how to do implement this in camps. Um, and I'd love to see if anybody has the, those types of resources. Uh, but I do think that GIZ and UN Habitat have two excellent tools on land use planning. These tools were specifically prepared for development context, but I think that their lessons are transferable, especially on issues of land tenure. The next phase is managing and government governing sites uh, or camps and settlements. So once camps and settlements have been established, the main focus of humanitarian actors, residents, and host communities shifts to how these sites will and resources around them will be managed. The medium and long-term housing, land, and natural resource needs of both the displaced and host communities will need to be carefully managed and governed. In the absence of careful governance, informal systems to govern and transact these resources will emerge from the populations themselves. We see this in uh, long-lasting camps all over the world. Um, and while this isn't necessarily a bad thing, humanitarian actors and government actors may or need, uh, need to play a proactive role to ensure that these systems are, are inclusive equitable, sustainable, and non-exploitative. And I believe that this morning, Kirsten Verstheim, sorry if I mispronounce your name, Kirsten, uh, Kristen, uh, <laughs> from NRC shared with all of you the community coordination toolbox, which I've actually linked to on the page here. Uh, many tools within this toolbox can be adapted to involve communities in the governance of housing, land, property, and natural resources within camps and settlements. And I've already spoken to uh, Kristen and the NRC team about some additions that could be made to make the toolkit even stronger. Um, there are also many tools that are available to guide CCCM practitioners on how to meaningfully include women specifically, um, and those from displaced uh, uh, communities in the management of sites. And again, much of the guidance from those, even if it doesn't explicitly address HLP issues, can be applied to HLP and natural resource governance issues. Um, there's also some interesting guidance emerging about how to restore degraded forests and landscapes um, around camps and how to develop agricultural livelihoods, again, again around camps and settlements. Most of this learning for, that I've found comes from specific country cases. Um, and I think it would be really interesting and useful to have best practices uh, or a best practices document uh, that collects examples from all over the world. Also, there's a, an existing robust toolkit for responding to threats of evictions, which I mentioned earlier as being sort of a, a recurring issue um, when landowners try to assert the, uh, their rights over displaced peoples. Um, and so there's a lot, of, um, a lot of great tools that have especially emerged over the past year. And so I put the link to that uh, on the page there. Um, although, Within uh, that area of work, uh, there so, still seems to be a need for guidance on how to facilitate relocations. Um, so when uh, evictions are unavoidable, either because um, of legal issues or because of protection issues, um, how to, to do that um, while sort of still protecting rights and being attentive to HLP issues. Um, there are some themes for which uh, HLP and natural resource sensitive guidance does seem to be completely lacking. And again, please let me know if I've missed anything uh, in the available tools. Um, specifically, how humanitarians can engage with land and property markets that emerge within camps and settlements. 
um, how to resolve HLP and natural resource disputes specifically within camp settings. There's some great tools about HLP and natural resource disputes in displacement in general, but I think that there could be some really interesting work tailored to the needs of camp, uh, camps and settlements. And then the last one is land tenure guidelines for the establishment of burial sites and waste management sites. And for burial sites, this especially came up uh, earlier this year or early last year when, uh, when COVID um, was, uh, was uh, emerging and a lot of uh, humanitarian practitioners were trying to prepare for the worst um, and trying to identify scarce land resources uh, for burials. Again, uh, around Cox's Bazaar, this was a, was a major issue. Um, and uh, when looking at the available guidance on uh, the establishment of burial sites, there's a lot that is done on environmental concerns, on, um, on cultural uh, appropriateness, but uh, it was actually quite, uh, there was no guidance about the land tenure impacts of uh, identifying an appropriate burial site, which uh, I think could be a really interesting area for um, further exploration. And now for the final phase, the closure of camps and settlements and their integration into local communities. So it seems like there's multiple pathways for the final stages of camp management. On one hand, there can be a mass return, uh, which then requires camps and settlements to be dismantled or for local communities to take over land and facilities. On the other hand, the returns can be limited and solutions need to be identified to more permanently integrate displaced populations into local communities. Or in many cases, they're so the situation is a bit of a hybrid between these two. And so within this phase, I've identified three themes. The first two are very much connected, is the integration into urban areas and securing the tenure of IDPs and refugees for durable integration. And then the third one is site closure and decommissioning. For the first two around integration, I think there's been a lot of interesting tools that have been prepared by development actors who work on informal settlements or slums. Um, in the past few years, there's been some really innovative um, work by these actors, and I would highly recommend that CCM and shelter actors build closer ties with that community of practice. And then for site closure and decommissioning, I wasn't able to find any globally relevant guidance specific to CCCM. All, however, I do think that mine action actors often face similar challenges when releasing land that has been recently demined or decontaminated. And I think that there could be some really interesting opportunities for CCCM and mine action organizations to share lessons and guidance on this. Oh, um, so overall, the Global Camp Management Toolkit is a bit inconsistent and occasionally contradictory on the role that CCCM practitioners can or should play in relation to HLP and natural resource tenure within and around camps. And to address this, I would also recommend maybe producing uh, a short brief to explain the above uh, themes for CCM practitioners. And if, global, if the Global Camp Management Toolkit is ever updated um, to have a dedicated HLP and natural resource specialist as a co-author. Um, so in all of this, I was wondering if there's any assessments that I've made that you disagree with or resources that I've missed or which of the rec recommendations that I've made also just resonate most with you as being priorities. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Um, we have a few minutes for questions and I'm gonna check the chat to see. Uh, I see that Giovanna has put in um, the, the coordination toolkit. Is the is the link to the camp co the community coordination toolbox that Alex? Yeah, has. thanks very much, Joe. Um, and Alex, I'm 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 going to put you on the spot and wonder uh, and ask you how much how much investigation you did into the minimum standards for camp management, and and where you think that there's a collaboration that we should be kind of um, further deepening in relationship to the minimum standards because I think that the camp management toolkit. Um, only is is going so far, but I do think that as far as um, you know, kind of looking towards the ways in which camp managers are managing sites, that that's maybe kind of uh, a shared responsibility, and that that shared responsibility maybe needs better articulation. But maybe you can you can just talk about what your what your reflections were in relationship to the minimum standards, because I didn't hear you make specific reference to it. I admit that the minimum standards did not make part of the review that I did. And so I'd actually welcome uh, having a look at that. And I'm sure that my, uh, my analysis would 
uh, change based off that. And I can maybe reach out to you directly afterwards with sort of my uh, findings. Yeah, I mean, I think it, I think it would be really great to have your reflection on it because those lines between where camp managers um, and because authorities are also camp managers and traditionally kind of the opening and closings of sites has come into the the our, of our three circles, the sphere of what of what the authorities are responsible for doing. I think that there's a lot of discussion that we should be having. Um, to, to maybe develop like more specific guidance or to be able to say something quite particular within the guidance notes about how that can be um, improved upon or better reflected upon because the, the, the whole um, site management support role that an international agency like NRC would play or you know, some of the other kind of practitioners of camp management that are on this call would probably benefit from knowing how to, how to make a more robust you know, recommendation or guidance around you know, what authorities could do. I know that there's been quite a lot of work done in Syria um, about ways in which CCCM and the HLP AOR can kind of work more closely together and, and some of those due diligence discussions but it would be nice to see how we could reflect that in, in kind of future iterations of the minimum standards. Absolutely. Um, so I see some questions. We have about one minute before we need to, I have to check my schedule now that we're like back on the new timeline. Oh, actually we have more than that. Um, so, you 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 have a lot of time to answer the questions. I'm sorry. I'm I'm the, the whole the whole we're ahead. We're behind. We're on time. Um. So it it would be great for you to answer this question that's coming in <clears throat> from Omar and um. And then also, I see one from Anna. So Anna's our our next presenter. So it'd be great. I'm going to start with hers. So in regards to housing, land, and property, Anna writes, do you know if there's been any examples of contracts or agreements regarding buildings with leasees or leasers of collected shelters instead of just tenured land contracts? So I guess she's talking more about leasing agreements and kind of due diligence that can be done with like prefabricated buildings. So over to you on that, Alex. Um, not to my knowledge. Um, I will focus specifically on the point of collective shelters. Um, I do think that there's some really interesting work that needs to be done and uh, to dig more into how to establish collective rights over a parcel of land or a building. Uh, I think that there's still a tendency to maybe identify a single uh, um, person on either side of the agreement. Um, where there's the landowner and perhaps one representative of uh, the occupants. Uh, and so how do, but especially in sort of maybe a, a, an informal tented settlement, there might be multiple families and how to reflect that in a tenure agreement in a way that sort of the voices of all the different uh, parties can be reflected in interest. Uh, and uh, I think that, that that's something that definitely requires a bit more uh, work. Um, but uh, I don't, I can't speak very much for, for uh, the prefab aspect. And then for Omar's comment, in some Why locations, despite, despite the lack of uh, proofed ownership documents, some organizations set up water distribution networks and other utilities, landowners sued these organizations. Any advice or recommendations on how to avoid that? And I think that goes back to sort of my original recommendations of there needs to be one, a due diligence that to identify who the landowners are and the various rights holders are. Uh, I try to avoid saying landowners um, just because there may be other rights holders to that land that don't necessarily have what we classically understand as ownership, but they still do have uh, important rights to that land. Um, and then to avoid getting sued is to, going back to sort of my, uh, my access point is that there needs to be uh, an, the ability to negotiate with these uh, rights holders from the host community on how to address their legitimate concerns. Obviously, uh, there could be some profiteers, there could be some people who sort of exploit uh, the situation, 
But I think that there's a way to do sort of an interest-based negotiation to address some legitimate concerns to be able to then uh, proceed. Um, and then, of course, there's always the practice of eminent domain, where governments could say, this is a situation where, um, where essentially we need to extinguish the rights of the host communities to be able to resettle um, a, or, or to, to uh, settle uh, IDPs. And, but the government, ha uh, essentially humanitarian actors have to push governments to follow sort of those legal processes and not just uh, arbitrarily extinguish the rights of host communities. And if they do go through that process of eminent domain, there needs to be a process of compensation uh, for uh, host communities for any law, uh, rights that have been extinguished. And then yes, in Northwest Syria, there is no government. Um, and ultimately that, uh, and I think that that's where there needs to be more of an emphasis on negotiating in good faith with the, the host community um, rights holders. Um, because if, especially if the government or if the local authorities do not have that ability to extinguish land rights in, uh, in any uh, meaningful way, then absolutely, uh, then the, the best way to go forward is to try to find ways to negotiate with the uh, rights holders. I like the way you're shifting the discussion and calling them rights holders. And I think that that's, that's really um, useful terminology for us to try to internalize because I think that there's a number of different contexts and obviously Syria is, is a very well known one and not just Northwest Syria, but also um, other parts of Syria, different parts during the, during the conflict have um, been more visible in, in, this, in this issue. Um, but there are other places in, in the world that um, certainly uh, it's not always a, a government that everybody is, um, is kind of talking through this with. Um, I, I really do love the, it's the one I'm most familiar with, but love the example from Syria where the, where the guidance has been so clearly listed. And I don't know, Alex, if you can put that in the chat right now. Um, and, and it can stand as inspiration for other kind of CCCM um, and HLP colleagues and they do a really good job kind of defining the informal sites and kind of the scope of the agreement which i think is is really useful and, and quite interesting to people who are working more in informal settlements or more on out of camps approaches and ways in which this kind of very practical guidance thanks so much for putting it in there um i see jim has also made a comment um it would be great to document learning from these examples and what has been done and, and where there's been some successes. And I think that leads us back to the discussion we were having at eight o'clock this morning, which was about um, case studies and, um, you know, kind of longitudinal looking at case studies and coming back and saying, um, well, not just, you know, like capturing the lessons learned for the last, you know, few, few months or, you know, year and a half that people were working on it and wrote up the case study, but are there um, ways in which we could look at doing a, a longitudinal case study and look at something kind of back in the, in the history that could be then, you know, a learning document for us and a way in which to document best practices and ways in which we could could further the discussion around um, HLP. Then I see that Jim has joined us. Um, Jim Robinson, who's the, the chair of the HLP AOR. So maybe it'd be great to hear from him since we're kind of working on this together. Jim, you have eight minutes. Uh -huh. Well, I won't need eight minutes, I'm sure. Um, Thanks. No, and thanks, Alex. Thanks so much for like let, setting out what you've been working on. It's been um, really a great sort of review of, of what's of, of some of the documents. I just thought I'd comment just to um, set out a little bit of the process that um, sort of Alex has sort of has been part of, and 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 also to I, th I suppose just make the sort of wider point around uh, where this kind of fits within some of the work we're doing with the CCCM and the HLP sort of working group or interest group. Um, so we we established that group just earlier this year, and there's been um, sort of real amazing uh, participation from CCCM colleagues and. 
Um, and one of the things we wanted to do was try and understand what guidance was already in existence and what where were the gaps. And that's where Alex has been leading on that. And it's um, and so so one of the ways we did that was ask people to contribute with documents, uh, guidance, uh, experiences that had been uh, where they'd actually developed sort of work on specific HLP issues or where there were things that they thought could be useful. And we held a session in April around a, a, a sort of introduced some colleagues from Somalia and um, Iraq, presented some of that work that they've been doing, particularly around evictions. Um, and again, just examples of great collaboration between uh, CCCM and HLP um, actors and you know, the AOR or subclusters or working groups in different contexts. Um, and, and so from, from that kind of submission of guidance and documents, um, sort of Alex has produced this review and identified these gaps. And um, I think it's um, a really interesting uh, sort of project and, and, and your comment earlier on the thinking about the minimum standards and, um, and, and where this sort of work might fit feels like something that could be part of of what this working group is able to, to develop. And that was, you know, the idea is to see, you know, where there are uh, ways in which there's existing things that can complement, but also where there are these uh, gaps for it. So also your suggestion, again, of that longitudinal case study idea, that, that, that way of sort of collecting together some of the uh, application of these uh, tools, I think would be really helpful because uh, the Somalia and Iraq examples were both uh, really interesting and would be good to actually sort of really understand what worked and what could be uh, used and adapted in other contexts. So, um, yeah, so all I would say is that there's, uh, you know, this is an ongoing piece of work and it'd be great to have uh, more of you involved and participating. Um, I think there will definitely be some uh, scope and opportunity to look at how we collaboratively address some of these uh, gaps if, if, if you and colleagues want to take these forward. And it's something I, I'm currently sort of leading the working group with, with Juan and with um, Ibero Lopez, who's the uh, uh, shelter cluster HLP advisor. So we're trying to look across those three uh, sort of clusters and areas to, um, to work together to sort of, uh, yeah, address some of these issues. And just want to finish by just acknowledging that um, CCCM actors are, are so often really engaging with communities, working with these issues in a very sort of practical, pragmatic way. So I think often, yeah, there's so much that can be learned and drawn from what your experiences are. And, and it'd be great to try and capture this, which is part of the aims of the, the working group as well. So I'll finish there, but I will put a couple of links in, in the chat just in case people want to get in touch or if they want to um, sign up to sort of be on the mailing list for the working group and make sure they are uh, sort of hearing about what we're up to. But that's all from me. Thanks, Jim. That was exactly what I was going to ask for was some contacts of who, who people should reach out to. So practical and pragmatic. That was the nicest compliment that anybody's given us all day. And um, if you can then put in the contacts that people should be getting in touch with from um, your side, that would be really great. So thank you, Alex, very much for your for your research and for you know kind of considering these issues and for Jim coming in and giving us some context with it and and for the questions. Keep keep the hard questions coming in. I think that's really useful. And it 